Welcome to Qatar, the controversial venue for football's World Cup. Until now, the national passion here has been camel racing. Even on training days, hundreds go through their paces outside the capital, Doha. But this is being overtaken by a sport some say has no place in the desert. Camels don't mind searing heat. Footballers do. Just ask French star Abdes Wadou. Trop petit, les gars. Il fait plus de 50 degrés. J'ai joué là-bas, et je peux vous dire que au mois de juin, juillet, c'est impossible de jouer. Il faut arrêter de mentir. On ne peut pas jouer là-bas. C'est impossible. Football's governing body FIFA didn't seem to worry about that when it gave Qatar the 2022 tournament. For decades, officials have run the federation as a personal fiefdom. But last week's arrest of seven executives at the annual Congress in Zurich has put the heat back on FIFA. This really is the World Cup of fraud. And today we are issuing FIFA a red card. They corrupted the business of worldwide soccer to serve their interests and to enrich themselves. Tonight, we go inside its most notorious decision. Was Qatar a bold choice to bring the World Cup to the Middle East, or a sordid deal with a state that treats workers like slaves? We cannot accept to play in stadiums where people lost their lives. They built stadiums with blood. If money was all that mattered, Qatar would be a sporting paradise. Since the 1990s, this oil-rich state has been developing the world's biggest gas field. That's given it the funds to turn Doha into a new Manhattan. Qatar has imported more than a million foreign workers, mainly from South Asia, to build all the stadiums, hotels and transport systems for the World Cup. Going for a walk means dodging bulldozers. This is not a welcoming place for pedestrians. Qatar doesn't like nosy reporters either. As night falls, we're heading to a place we're not supposed to go with a woman who's not supposed to be here. When we discovered the conditions here when I took over this job in 2010, it was actually modern day slavery. Sharon Burrow was once president of Australia's peak trade union body, the ACTU. Hi there. Now she risks arrest to visit Doha's restricted workers' camps. You can see that on the outside this looks almost human. And then you walk in here and you see there are 300 odd men here in about 20 rooms. And uh, hi, how are you? Nice to see you. How are you? What did you do? She heads the International Trade Union Confederation in Brussels, representing workers from 155 countries. Hi guys, you're still eating. Can we come in? Qatar is per capita the world's richest country. Its 290,000 citizens enjoy immense wealth. But these men from Nepal get just $50 a week. They cook and they wash right next to the sanitation block, which you'll see is terribly scummy. Well, I don't have to tell you what to make of this. This is dinner time. This is cooking. Mm -hmm. And when you can imagine, you know, 40 or 50 men in here trying to prepare meals in what is totally unsafe conditions. You'll see the gas bottles simply sitting right. outside in the open area. Yeah. And, uh, and it's filthy. I mean, it's just filthy. So you can be working 10, 11, yeah. sometimes. Yes. And what, uh, do they pay you overtime? <laughs> do they pay you extra for overtime? No extra. No extra. They no. just bring you back when they decide you're going to finish. Yeah. How Foreign workers give up even basic rights. There's little they can do if the boss cuts their wages. They can't even leave without the boss's permission. There's no effective compliance system. No businesses are prosecuted. 
they live in squalor and when it's so desperate they just want to go home, they find themselves trapped in Qatar. They are owned by another individual, lock, stock and barrel. That's slavery. These worker slums are Qatar's dirty secret. And it's using secret police to stop anyone exposing it. Recently, television crews from the BBC and Germany were thrown in jail when they tried to film scenes like this. It's not the image you get from Qatar's glossy World Cup videos. Gas and oil money have funded a global feel-good campaign, presenting Doha as friendly, modern and open. Qatar even funds Al Jazeera, the global television news network with a reputation for fearless reporting. When three of its journalists were jailed in Egypt, the network campaigned for their release under the slogan, Journalism is not a crime. But here's the thing, here in the home of Al Jazeera, journalism can be a crime. You see, we spent months applying for permission to come here, and when we received our filming permit, it pointedly excluded all these industrial estates and workers' camps. So if police see us here, they will arrest us and stop us filming, which is why we're moving very quickly with small cameras. This may be the chosen venue for the World Cup, but this is something the Qatari government doesn't want the world to see. Mustafa Kadri has experienced that firsthand. He grew up in Sydney but is now based in London for Amnesty International. We come in with the permission of the Qatari government, but the reality is that any moment now, the manpower companies, the ones most responsible for abuse, could come in and, you know, call the police and uh, tell us to be, you know, to be detained, arrested for talking to their workers uh, without their permission. Um, it actually happened a few days ago where police came and we cooperated with them and we went to the police station. Uh, it took us about six, seven hours to explain things, uh, but they let us go. At the end of the day, we can complain. We're Amnesty International and the Qatari government does listen to us. We can also leave the country. But for workers here, they can be physically and verbally abused. They can lose their visa, which is their livelihood. They can be stuck in detention centres or they can be kicked back home. Foreign workers now outnumber Qataris by more than four to one. They're kept on a tight leash by a system called kafala. That gives the employer the right to decide where they work and when or even if they can leave. Labourers and domestic servants have to give their passports to the boss. If you try to leave and your employer decides that uh, they're not going to issue you either with an exit visa or what they call an NOC, which allows you to transfer your employment to someone else, then that employer has absolute power over you, another human being. So the cries we get every night on the emails, I'm trapped in Qatar. This is your house. Home? Yes. And sometimes they're trapped without money. We came across a group of Nepalese teenagers who'd been brought here by a manpower company in Kathmandu. After paying for flights and the company's fee, they arrived to find there were no jobs and no wages. But the sponsor was still keeping their passports, so they couldn't complain. Fifteen. Fifteen people. Yeah. One room. Yeah. Fifteen one room. people. Yeah. Wow. Do you have the name of the company that you paid the money to? Do you have a card? or card, yeah. you have a card? Yeah. yeah. What's it called? Yeah. Honesty Overseas PLTD LTD. It's called Honesty Overseas. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. OK, so the company you paid the money to that yeah. stole your money yeah. and brought you here is called Honesty. Honesty. That's great. Yeah, Honesty. What are you going to... When you get back to Nepal, when you go home, if, if a friend says, I would like to go to Qatar, what will you say? Don't like Qatar. Don't go. <laughs> after don't like, like Qatar, after company, no like. Yeah, yeah, okay. Well, good luck, guys. Thanks. Good luck. Thank you. Yeah. Even star footballers can be trapped. Abdes Wadou lives in Nancy in northern France, where he was a professional midfielder. Four years ago, he was lured to play in Qatar for a team owned by the Crown Prince. 
comme je suis euh, de confession euh, euh, musulmane, euh, je me suis dit, ouais, j'aimerais bien euh, découvrir finalement ce pays-là, un pays musulman, jouer dans un pays musulman, terminer ma carrière dans un pays musulman. But it turned out to be the worst mistake of your life. <laughs> Exactement. Je pense que euh, c'est la, la plus mauvaise, euh, le plus mauvais choix de carrière euh, que j'ai pu faire euh, euh, durant ces 17 années de, de football. I show you all the souvenirs. At first, he was a hero, leading his team to victory. I had a bad moment, but I had some good moments as well. Mm -hmm with these victories when we won the, the title in, in, in Qatar. Uh, but then he was ordered to change clubs from the La Quoia team. I said, why? I signed for La Quoia. I came from, from, from France, I bring my family because I signed for La Quoia. He said, no, these words come from the, the Emir. So all what is, uh, comes from the Emir is not subject to discussion. When they cut his salary and he complained to FIFA, he was denied an exit visa. Soit vous acceptez le deal, ou soit vous vous rendez, comme vous dites, vous vous rendez, et on vous donne votre, votre exit visa. Autrement, si vous n'obtempérez pas, vous êtes emprisonné. Vous ne pouvez rien faire. Parce que ce système de kafala, finalement, euh, ne vous donne aucun droit. Unlike poor labourers, he decided to fight. Months of complaints to the players' union and the French government succeeded in bringing him home. Still, it took two years in court to get the money he was owed. His football career over, he's now training to be a coach. They live for football, they wake up for football, and uh, definitely it's one of the best sports in the world and uh, it makes dreams a lot of people. He is incensed that Qatar is hosting the World Cup. Comment une, une telle compétition prestigieuse qui réunit des millions de personnes peut se tenir dans un pays qui ne respecte pas les droits de l'homme et qui où, où il y a de l'esclavagisme encore. The winner to organize The 222 FIFA World Cup is Qatar. The choice of Qatar over Japan, South Korea, the US and Australia led to immediate suspicion of bribery. FIFA president Sepp Blatter continues to deny there was anything wrong with the bid. He's just been re-elected despite his executives being charged with bribery, money laundering and racketeering. We're dealing with an organisation that really has a, a culture of corruption in over generations, and you don't change culture by keeping the same leadership. You have to change the leadership. Hi, I'm Jamie Fuller, chairman of Ultra Performance Sportswear brand Skins. Swiss-based entrepreneur Jamie Fuller is trying to organise a FIFA boycott. Skins are proud to announce that, as of now, we've become the first official non-sponsor of FIFA. This is... This is The kitchen, kitchen. Yeah. He combines good publicity for his brand with an ethical stance, even sneaking into Doha's workers' camps to get evidence of ill treatment. I saw some of the worst instances of appalling bathroom facilities, sanitary facilities, cooking and eating facilities you could possibly imagine. But his approach is a rarity in the commercial world. Sponsors like Coca-Cola, Visa and McDonald's have clung to FIFA despite the stench of corruption. Foreign companies have been clamouring for a slice of Qatar's building boom. The government has earmarked a staggering $260 billion for infrastructure. With a population of less than 300,000, that works out to almost a million dollars per person. They could all fit comfortably in the planned stadiums. Not that many are likely to bother. Now you might think that with all these billions being spent on so many stadiums, that Qatar is a football mad nation. No.
This is a typical football crowd in Doha, almost non-existent. Barely 50 Qataris have turned up for an international game, even though admission is free. The only other spectators are some Pakistani construction workers who managed to get here from their distant work camps and some very excited Yemenis. No prizes for guessing who's winning. But even if locals don't follow football, most are glad to be hosting the cup. It's not only a big deal for Qatar, it's a big deal for all Arabs and Muslims, really. You know, because this is the first time that we get to show something positive. And this one here, it's sort of uh, see no evil, hear no evil, <laughs> speak no evil. Yeah. Khaled al Bai is no apologist for authoritarian regimes. So this went viral. He's a political cartoonist whose drawings became symbols of the Arab Spring. And the message is that we're not on anybody's side. We're just Muslims. He believes Western media are painting a false picture of how Qatar treats workers. That you're with the terrorists. Of course, of course we care. Of course, of course the government cares about the laborers and, you know, trying to make things better. And, you know, but when the population is grown so fast in such little time, a lot of things get out of hand. Qatar's construction boom has happened so fast that even its residents are having trouble keeping up. Hullard was born in Sudan but has lived in Doha since he was a boy. It's totally a different city. I mean, you know, before I used to know the, the places, but now it's just, I don't even know where to take my car. It never stops. Uh, there's projects going and every day there's new cities are being built. It's not that they're building a stadium or two, they're building cities. He believes the government is genuinely trying to improve conditions. Hopefully, if everything goes according to plan, the labour laws are going to change. The kafala system is going to change, not only because of the labourers, but because of people like myself who have been living here all our lives. So gradually things are going to change because, and, and that's the difference with Qatar is that, you know, the leadership is young. You've got two people there, two people there, and two of about four each in this tiny little apartment. Sharon Burrow is not so sure. Every time we've gone to them, Amnesty, Human Rights Watch, it's been the same story. We'll fix it. We're going to do a review. We'll change the laws. We'll build accommodation. That's a joke. It's a really bad joke. The kafala system equals slavery. The Qatari government has guaranteed $4 billion to... There's one criticism that Qatar has managed to deal with, the fact that it's too hot to play football here in summer. FIFA has agreed to move the 2022 World Cup to winter, upsetting the entire European football calendar in the process. Qatar claims every stadium will be fully air-conditioned. But Qatar will continue to build them in the hottest months when conditions for workers are deadly. Accidents are frequent. We watched as this man almost lost a leg. Our estimates are very, very conservative. There's only two countries who actually keep accurate records. They're Nepal and India. More than 200 workers from each of those countries every year die on the job in Qatar. So at that rate, and two out of some 30 countries that have MOUs with Qatar, more than 4,000 workers could die before a ball is kicked in 2022. It doesn't have to be like that. I'm um, from Kenya. From Kenya? Yes, Sharon Burrow says it's almost impossible to raise these issues with the government. And how much do you get paid? Outside the ruling Altani family, nobody seems to be in charge. It's an incredible country. No one takes responsibility. It's like a family business. Every sheikh and their family will run something, but there's no connected system of government or governance as we would understand in any democratic country. As modern as it might look, Qatar is a feudal autocracy. The supreme leader is the emir, Sheikh Tamim bin Hamad bin Khalifa al-Tani, who recently took over from his father. 
working out the chain of command beneath him is not easy. Every day we would ring ministries and government departments. Often nobody even answered the phone. Now we've been trying to find someone in the government we can talk to about these issues, but this is a family-run government and the family ain't talking, at least not to us. However, the government's Human Rights Commission has a website that sets out the many reforms it's undertaken to help workers, all in a slickly produced video. It starts with a young cuttery boy passing a foreign worker and deciding to give him a bottle of water. The man is overcome with gratitude. It goes on to show how workers are now paid through bank accounts so they can be sure to get their wages. We were keen to meet these lucky workers, or at least somebody we could ask about them. After days of rejection, we managed to track down a member of the ruling family. There is nothing more overwhelming than watching young athletes give their first taste of international competitions. A moment that will live with them for the rest of their lives. Sheikh Saud bin Abdurrahman Al Thani, who heads Qatar's Olympic Committee, was signing a new agreement with the International School Sport Federation. I was keen to ask him about Qatar's promise to abolish the kafala system, under which the boss takes the worker's passport. I think there is a lot of systems that has been already done and there is things that are at the end of the process and we are sure that, you know, uh, things will be done according to the, uh, you know, the level uh, when you are hosting such a big event. Do you know when that will happen? Um, well, I'm not, so I'm not updated to this, but as I said to you, things have already happened and things are already in the process and things will come also in the future. No other official would talk to us, but just as we were about to leave Qatar, a breakthrough. Well, after months of negotiations and days of waiting, we've finally been given the go-ahead to go and film one of the stadiums for the World Cup. So we're heading out to the Al Wakra Stadium, if we can find it in this dust storm. Finally, we made it to the site. You must wear PPE, hard hat, safety glasses, visibility vest, safety shoes. Before we could go anywhere, there was a compulsory safety briefing and compulsory safety gear. Then, unexpectedly, a half-hour delay. Police boarded the media bus, demanding to know who'd given permission for us to film. Excuse me, put your... Finally, we were permitted to see the high-security earthworks for Al Wakra. It was no surprise to see every worker clad from tip to toe in safety gear. Al Wakra will be one of about a dozen showpiece stadiums for the World Cup. Part of Qatar's winning pitch was that many stadiums would be dismantled once the tournament's over and donated to Africa. Our tour was organised by the grandly named Supreme Committee for Delivery and Legacy of the World Cup. They believe they have a good story to tell, even if they're strangely shy about telling it. Now, unfortunately, nobody working for the Supreme Committee was allowed to come on camera to talk to us. But off camera, they reject the allegation that workers are dying to build these stadiums. In fact, they say since work began last year, out of some 3,000 workers, there hasn't been a single fatality and only eight minor injuries, the worst being someone off site who tripped over and broke their ankle, which does seem a remarkable safety record. Ba -da -da. We were then taken to a model workers' village with excellent food, medical care and recreation facilities. Nice. Even internet to contact their families or just watch cricket. Conscious of appalling publicity, Qatar really is improving conditions for the full-time stadium workers. The problem is they're just a tiny fraction of the workforce. More than a million others live in slums around Doha and they're getting almost nothing. I mean, when you compare it to Doha, the city, 
which is this amazing big, you know, gleaming city with, you know, like a modern city. And it, it feels like you're in the third world, not in, um, you know, one of the richest countries in the world. Uh, there's, there's no uh, proper sewage system, uh, you know, electricity, often there are issues with that. It's a very basic accommodation. And what really is, um, you know, strikes me is that these are the workers building stadiums, buildings, hospitals that in the years ahead will be, you know, the showcases for how developed this country is, and yet this is how they're living. Despite the promise of ending or easing kafala, it's being applied with brutal effect. And we've seen only in the last few weeks with the Nepali earthquake, um, there have been a huge number of Nepalis have been prevented from returning home for family members' funerals because the Qatari authorities and their employers have refused to give them permission. Justice officials on two continents are now investigating how Qatar won the bid. US prosecutors are planning more arrests of FIFA officials. Swiss police are now probing allegations of bribery. No matter what's found, it's highly unlikely Qatar will lose the cup. Too much money has been spent, too much has already been built for the tournament to be stripped away. And for all the controversy, all the accidents and deaths, some hope the World Cup might still be a force for good. Really, no one should be praising migrant labour conditions in Qatar, but the World Cup is an incredible opportunity for Qatar to really demonstrate that it's genuinely trying to improve the conditions for labour. If things urgently are not done to you know, change the situation, we are really worried that that World Cup will not be remembered for the, the Games, but for a World Cup built on the back of you know, migrant labour abuse.